Hello and welcome to the Montana Museum of Art and Culture. I'm Raphael Chacon, the director, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to Homage to Africa, selections from the Tony Hoyt and Molly Shepard collections. Uh, we're delighted to have this exhibition here in Missoula, Montana, and it's a pleasure also today to welcome Molly Shepard and Tony Hoyt. So we're gonna be doing shortly an interview with the two of them and talk about their histories with these uh, wor exquisite works of art and their whole attitude towards collecting African art. So welcome Molly and Tony. Welcome to the Montana Museum of Art and Culture. I understand you guys have an Ithaca connection, an, yeah. an upstate New York connection. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you both uh, spent some time or were born there. What's, tell me what the connection is. Go ahead. Oh, well, my, my uh, mom's family had a revolutionary war grant. That's how they paid uh, revolutionary soldiers for the Revolutionary War and for the War of 1812. And of course, I imagine they mostly were giving them land that they had stolen from the indigenous people who lived around the Finger Lakes. So my history there goes way, way, way back, mostly a little bit north of Ithaca around a place called Trumansburg, New York, great, on the great. side of uh, Cuga Lake. So, so upstate New York is your home. That's, that's where you hail from, right? Yeah. And Molly, you, you mentioned that you actually lived there for a while? No, I never lived there. Um, my first husband was from Ithaca. Father was at Cornell. And so I spent a lot of time in Ithaca. And uh, in addition to being at Cornell, the family had a contemporary furniture and accessories store in Ithaca, still does, actually. And uh, so that, that was my experience in, in Ithaca. So you both know that part of the world well. Certainly in days gone by. I can't, I can't uh, speak to any familiarity right now, so. Great. So my first question really is about um, how you began collecting uh, African art. What uh, brought you to it? And uh, tell us a little bit about your origins. So why don't we start with Tony? Well, my mom was an artist. And growing up, I was mostly surrounded by her art. She was accomplished and did different mediums. And when I was in high school, they had the, uh, the World's Fair was in New York City. And World's Fair in those days were much bigger than they are now. Every little country had a pavilion. Every country. And Guinea, a uh, country of Guinea, had a pavilion. They were uh, on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain then for us, but they did have a pavilion. And not only did I go there a couple times with my dad, but my mom went there a few times. And right away, she noticed these great big nimbus, which are you know, tall sculptures from uh, the Nimba Mountains of Guinea on the Liberian-Guinea border. So when the, she started talking to him a little bit, and after a while, she realized, well, like a lot of third world countries, they gave them all kinds of money to build this pavilion to get everything there, but they didn't give them money to send things back. So she approached them and says, what if I uh, buy those three big nimbus from you? And I'm sure that that went into somebody's pocket. So everybody was happy. And that's when I first saw my very first African art. And she sort of told me how important African art was to modern art. And then, yeah, go ahead. And, and let me interrupt you. We have two of those nimbas on view currently, right? Yes. What happened to the third one? My uh, uh, stepfather's daughter got one of them. The third nimba mask is, is still in the country and it's still in the family. Yeah, yeah great, great. So, okay, continue a, a little bit about your collection. So, uh, when my mom heard that I was going to go in the Peace Corps in Liberia, I mean, and I knew nothing about Liberia. I think I had to look on the map. First, I thought, you mean Libya? No, 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 Liberia. Oh, oh, I see, West Africa, West African rainforest. She said, Tony, you're going to be in the heart of beautiful, the heart of beautiful art. And at that same point, she was married to the president of Ithaca College. They were building this brand new, beautiful college on top of the end of, of Cuga Lake, even higher than Cornell, looking down the lake. And she, uh, with her influence, they were going to start a museum. So she says, what if you start collecting for me if it's possible? So she gave me some funds and taught me a little bit about it, just like how to tell a airport art from real art, <clears throat> some basic little lessons. 
And I had no idea if I'd even see it, unless, you know, maybe in the Capitol. But uh, boy, pretty soon, the, 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 these guys were Charlies. They are itinerant art salesmen. <clears throat> and they learn which Peace Corps volunteers would buy pieces and which could care less. And once you're on the list as, as a buyer, then they start making more regular visits. So I just started getting whatever I could get. And then my uh, mom came over to visit and took all that stuff back with her. And then she went and found other outlets in Monrovia. And then she spent like, they spent two or three weeks in Dakar, Senegal. And I guess that is a real center to buy uh, West African art. And she, that's where she, all the real big pieces came from, that she was able to sh ship all of that back. And then I bought some stuff for myself. Unfortunately, uh, my house burned to the ground in 72, so I lost a lot of my personal collection. But luckily, some of it was with my mom, some was with some relatives who gifted it back to me after the house burned down, which was very nice because I lost all my pictures, and they gifted back prints to me, too. And then I thought, well, I'm, that, that's it. I have a, a nice collection. My mom passed away, and my brother wasn't interested in it. He wanted her pre-Columbian stuff. He didn't want the African stuff. So I got the whole collection minus one piece that he has. He said, I'll, I said, you take whatever piece you want. He said, I'll take this beautiful piece here. And I thought, well, that's, that's it. You know, I'm not ever going to get any more African pieces. When I went back to Liberia in 78, was it, right before their first big civil war, it, it changed so much. It, it, I think the art was already gone. You know, most of it was gone. Some pieces put away you weren't ever going to see. And then I got to know Doug Allard, who was mostly a trader in Native American art, who has a, you know, had his trading post in St. Ignatius, and he also had a big... Uh, auction in the, in, down in Tempe every year that his son runs now. And I found out, work, I used to work out with him at the tribal center for years. And somewhere in there he said, you know, I got some uh, African pieces. I don't know anything about them. Some guy came through and I bought what he had. And I went and looked. I went, oh my goodness, this is cool stuff, Doug. You, you don't know anything about this? So, what, what, let's, make, let's make a deal. So I bought about two-thirds, three-quarters of everything he had. And then after he passed away, we had been talking about buying the rest. And when he passed away, I went to talk to his daughters. I said, you know, I was talking to your dad about, uh, you know, this other pieces you got, and I, I think I'd like to buy most of those, too. And the daughters said, fine with me. We don't know anything about it. Go for it. So that's how I got the rest. You know, sometimes when I think about your collections, I think you're, in some ways, you're at the tail end of about 500 years of collecting. If you think about African art sort of first emerging in Western, in Western collections in the, uh, in the late Middle Ages, in the late 15th century, and then sort of heating up through the colonial period through the 19th century and into the, well into the 20th century. But in some ways, what we have in these this 500 years is a kind of snapshot of art that has been made for centuries, millennia, art that just hasn't survived for the kind of reasons that you that you mentioned. So, uh, so in some ways, what our museums hold today and our private collections hold today is a snapshot of African art in in this particular you know half a millennium. And there obviously were many, many millions of objects prior to that that are now gone because they've essentially gone back to, uh, to the earth. So we've had these massive disruptions of life, uh, certainly in Western Africa along that, uh, that Guinea coast, as a result of the world coming there and, and uh, Africans exiting from there in uh, all kinds of different circumstances. And their foolish uh, colonial bounties. That's right, that's right. So Molly, um, tell us a little bit about your interest in African art. How did you start collecting? Well, I, I think it my, in my case, um, we have to go all the way back to when I was a child. And I was always intrigued by weaving. Um, and I used to like to draw and with a compass and a, and a protractor and a ruler. And intersecting lines always intrigued me. Um, 
when my mom let me uh, redo my bedroom as a child, I, I had the walls repapered in burlap because I liked the, uh, the earthy color and the sensuousness of the texture. Um, but I guess fast forward, um, I had a fair amount of art history in college and in graduate school too, and uh, gradually learned something about textiles and was particularly intrigued by textiles from other parts of the world outside the Western tradition. Um, but it wasn't really, I think, until the mid-80s uh, when I would go back to Boston on a regular basis that I started to see uh, Cuba textiles, specifically the velvets, in a couple of shops that I frequented um, in Boston. And I was really drawn to them in some innate, very fundamental kind of way. Um, and so I bought one, two, three, and took them home and lived with them um, and became so intrigued with them and with their makers and how they were made and what they were about. Um, and, you know, gradually as I learned more, uh, I began to explore and go to other cities where they would have galleries, particularly specializing in African art or what they were then calling tribal art. Um, I'm not terribly fond of that expression, but um, <clears throat> nonetheless, gradually I began to acquire um, uh, more and more of these textiles. And um, as I learned more, I cared more, and <laughs> I didn't set out in planning to build a collection. That was never my intention at all, but rather it just became a passion, I think. Um, something I cared about deeply and still do. So the, uh, the next question is, what have you sought in African art? And I guess what I'm not asking you here, what kinds of things have you been uh, tracking down and purchasing and collecting? Mm -hmm. It's really what, what kinds of things um, um, has African art brought into your life? What is it that you seek in African art that has been uh, so wonderful by, by way of collecting? I like the relationship between African art, the materials that are used in African art, and the earth. African art seems to grow from, from the ground in a sense. Most of these textiles, for example, are not mapped out or planned in advance. Instead, they're, they're created spontaneously. The spirit moves them, I guess, in some sense. There's a freshness and an energy to them, a dynamism, if you like. I think that you often don't feel from art that's more hierarchical and structured. There's a close relationship between the materials and the meaning of the art. Um, and I'm drawn to that, I think, instinctively. And I tend to like abstraction anyway, better than representation. Uh, that's not always true, but I think as a general rule, abstraction intrigues me and um, I, I think you often, uh, one strains to read too much into abstraction. I mean, what does this mean? What is it about? And we Westerners are kind of inclined, I think, to do that in a way that the makers did not intend. Um, but I'm intrigued by the way the traditional patterns and motifs uh, are worked together um, they're sometimes colliding, sometimes intersecting. Um, sometimes they make for a chaotic, even, piece of work. And I find that really intriguing. And yet some of them are, I mean, I'm looking at some of these textiles around you, and some of them are, um, have very sophisticated designs. Yes. And that either comes from a long heritage of design work traditions of designing and designing and designing and sort of mastering certain patterns. Um, or it comes from a, an intentional planning as well. I mean, there is certainly vivacity in that, but, um, but you have degrees of, you know, of exquisite sophistication on the one hand and then spontaneity at, at, at the other in, in a lot of this work. Yes, that, that's certainly true. Um, so many of these motifs are ancient in origin uh, and they are 
I think, frequently borrowed from other cultures, certainly as of all of the early 16th and into the 17th century, when Africa began to be colonized, some of the motifs that you see in, in the works around us today, I think, represent an African take on European motifs or symbols or emblems. And, you know, it, it always kind of intrigues me that, yes, that those were absorbed or incorporated into African art. And then the, it, it got flipped in many ways, I think, the, the, in the early 20th century, when the Europeans began to borrow so heavily from African art. And they were intrigued by, I think, the dynamism and um, uh, the way the symbols had been utilized. And they built you know, a whole new uh, style of art in European history uh, yeah. on those African themes and I think it's. I think it's easy, excuse me for interrupting, but I think it's easy for us to assume that African is provincial or remote. And yet what we have to acknowledge is that it's, a, it's been a cosmopolitan con continent for millennia, always in, in dialogue with the outside world, always as part of tr vast trade networks. So even the remotest places were often in dialogue with uh, very, very far places far afield. And I think it, just looking at patterns, you can see that you know, ties and connections to the outside world. Um, let me shift to, to you, Tony. What is it that African art um, has offered you? Well, I was a history and anthro major. I, I learned about my love of anthropology a little bit late, so I only got a minor in it. But I was just fascinated with the culture. And then to be able to sent to a essentially living culture in Liberia at the very end of the road with no running water and no electricity. I mean, this was a living culture there. And these spirits, which have this terrible name in, in West Africa, all those masks are called devil masks, which I'm sure the early missionaries gave them because they had no understanding of them. And it was very strange and a little scary to them. But these figures came out and performed, you know, and they had, they were, you never knew who they were. They usually had to have a translator with them. And he sort of translated what they were saying because they'd be speaking in a very, very strange language. And they were all covered with raffia. And sometimes all you could see was the, the mask in the center. And they had them for every type of event from a, a wedding to a funeral plus to things that were much more secret and much more spooky and much more scary that we that a white person was not even allowed to see where they could come and say here's this uh, unfortunately they used the terms too in the english was the second language there's a devil coming out tonight and you should be staying in your house. We want all your shutters closed, and we don't want you to know anything about what's going on. And you could hear it. You could hear him calling this spirit in, and that he'd be playing a drum and doing something, but you weren't allowed to go out and deal with it in any way, shape, or form. So the whole cultural thing just fascinated me. And for somebody who was interested in anthropology and then to be sent, to this Gio culture way up country in Liberia was just, I mean, it was heaven on earth for me. <laughs> so I was just went, fascinated. So it went from being an academic subject for you to being a living subject. Right. I mean, to actually right. encounter a, a different culture with its integrity intact, right? <laughs> exactly. And then you have my whole influence from my mom about the art and, and growing up living with, you know, art from what she painted to painting to the Met every Saturday, you know, while the opera was on and blasted, full blast in the house, you know. So, uh, yeah, it just the whole cultural part just was fascinating to me. And these were like representations of that, of those cultures that just brought these wonderful, still does, these wonderful memories back of, of uh, some of those times, which doesn't exist now. You, you are both um, unique collectors, and you have your own particular tastes. I mean, the, you know, I, I like to think you, Tony, as leaning, uh, the, your art leans more towards the funky side of African art, and, and Molly, yours leans more towards the, uh, 
the elegant and maybe the sparse and the abstract, although you both obviously have places where, you know, arenas where you overlap, right? And you have similar pieces. Uh, These you are know. the great funky pieces of the people in that truck. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Exactly. But in some ways, so, so you're both unique in, in what you collect and how you collect, and, and certainly you're, you, you began in different places. But you're not unique in the sense that you are Westerners, you're members of Western civilization, the modern world, and uh, in, in, in that regard, you are part of a tradition of Westerners collecting African art. And they were collecting it for all kinds of reasons. Some of them are rather suspect today. Um, you know, for example, we know that the early modernists were really less interested in the anthropological side of things. They were only interested in the visage, right? The appearance, the formal properties the expressive properties of the sculpture, they really could care less about their context. But um, so I guess my point here is that in some ways, you are part of a long tradition of Westerners collecting African art. And so my, my question is, how do you distinguish your, your take on, on your collections from that long lineage of collecting? Um, I mean, how do you see yourself in relationship to you know, lots of other people, you know, collecting African art. In other words, what, uh, again, it's a question about motivations. Well, of course, mine was never done with the monetary value where another volunteer in our group who lived in a whole different part of the country, he then became, that became his career. And he opened a big uh, place in Los Angeles and I, I've lost track of him, but you know he might still be in the business or retired. He just stuck right with it. With me, it was just uh, the fascination with it and the design and the form of it and all those kind of things. And plus, Liberia was such a unique place. Remember, it wasn't an English colony and it wasn't a French colony, which were both very different in their taste too. It was this weird colony that was almost colonized by free American slaves. So maybe the art collectors hadn't even got there as much. Yeah, and certainly the, the patterns of selling art and collecting art in Liberia were very different from a British colony or a French colony where you, know, you had punitive expeditions that looted art. I mean, literally went in and looted whole royal compounds of their art, et cetera. And that's very different from the kind of um, trading, the free trading that took place in, in Liberia. Yeah. And the trade was really, I mean, they, you know, you, even where we were, we had Mandingo traders who lived in town permanently or came through once a year. The uh, Fulani cattle herders came through briefly, you know, so you, they've always had the moving contact. Yeah, trading, all kinds of stuff, foodstuffs, uh, textiles, and, and I'm, I'm sure including Power works shell, of art as well. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. So Molly, what's, what's your notion of how do you see yourself in relationship to this long history of collecting African art? I guess my introduction really to African art would have been in museums and to some extent in art, art history classes in um, undergraduate and graduate school. Um, but when I first became captivated, I guess, by the, the velvet pieces, the, the Cuba velvets, um, I, I, I was seeing them in galleries on the East Coast. Uh, and I just, I, I wanted to live with them. I wanted them to have them around me. Um, and Gradually, I started to expand, I guess, the, the places in which I acquired them. And sometimes I was as intrigued in the markets themselves and the people who were selling the objects in the markets as I was with the objects. You know, wonderful markets, for example, in New York. Um, and I now have gone, well, for the last four or five years to a market in Tucson that's, that's held annually down there. Um, Those big ones yes. do it also. Yes, yeah. they do oh, it. They do it, right. Um, and a number of my pieces have been acquired from itinerants who travel around the country and they have their wares in the back of pickups and they stop and 
that the word gets around uh, from people who are interested in, yeah. in, the, in the subject matter and you know and you go and look through the the objects um, so I guess I've acquired what I have from all kinds of sources some of them have been presents from friends too who know how much I care about this and have been kind enough to um, uh, grace me with another piece or piece and, and uh, pieces. A lot of African art started flooding into this country, I think, in, in the early 70s. Um, and when the big fighting started. Yes, yes. That, that's, that, that roughly yeah. Uh, yeah. contemporaneous with, with that period of time. And a fair amount of it, I think, was being brought into the country by Africans, some of whom were refugees or who were seeking another place or another market. A number of the objects, I think, were made for an export trade as opposed to internal um, consumption. So there were a variety of reasons, I think, why African art became uh, widely available in this country and I think also in Europe at about that period of time. Um, so, you know, I think once again we're seeing a, a resurgence of interest, fascination with African art in this country. Um, and African artists are becoming increasingly influential. And, you know, they bring a new take on their traditions to more contemporary forms. Uh, and I, I, it's just, it's not a recycling in that there, you know, there, there are new things that are coming out. It's not endlessly repeating itself. But um, collecting has become, I think, more diverse, more dynamic, more intriguing. Um, and there's, there's, there's simply a lot going on out there. I think it's safe to say, and I think Tony was alluding to this earlier, that African art is always evolving, always changing, and it's yeah. it's so varied from one village to the next, from one workshop to the next, and, and of course it's all responsive to the outside world today. Yes. So are either of you troubled by the, the concept of tourist art or um, airport art, I think was a phrase that, that one of you... Air, airport art is, I mean, it's beautiful, it's, it's often animals you know, in East Africa, and it's beautifully done, often in the ebony and all real shiny, but it's, it's made for tourists, and that's, that's, my mom coined that phrase with me, is that's airport art, and I'm not interested in airport art. It's right, so you I may not necessarily it. be collecting it, but you don't, you're not troubled by the fact that it exists. I mean, in some ways, it's, it's part of a long-standing tradition of Africans responding to the needs of the outside. I mean, we know, for example, that on the western, on the Guinea coast, the uh, African carvers began to respond to the Portuguese, uh, the the sailors coming around that, that coast and trading with them, and and began to almost immediately respond to the tastes of the outside world. So, I mean, the tourist art has a long history in Africa. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, let me ask you a question, and this is very much in the news these days, uh, and that's the, the question of colonialism and repatriation. In some ways, this is the hardest issue to, uh, to contend with. Uh, we know, for example, that recently uh, France has made a, an, an arrangement with some of the, uh, the Ghanaian coastal countries, uh, particularly over repatriating uh, works of art that were looted that were actually looted from yeah. uh, royal palaces, royal complexes, and wound up in, you know, in, in major collections, uh, national collections in, in France. And they've worked out arrangements now with those countries in Africa whereby some of the, that work can come back and be sort of shared, have a kind of shared custody of them. So they exist <laughs> for years in their home countries, and they, they're returned to France for a while, and, how do you feel about the whole concept of repatriation? Um, are you at all troubled by it? Does it does it impact your your having you know objects from Africa? How how do you how do you frame that in your in your way of thinking? I would think a lot with me would have to do with how it was acquired. If this was a raiding party that went up into some Benin area and took all their bronzes, then I mean they stole them. You know, and then these, at least some of the pieces I have, I have, you know, I have no idea who did them. Nobody will ever know. And they were certainly sold voluntarily. So it's a, it's a, a tough one. You know, uh, I don't think this is a cultural appropriation. 
to me, it's cultural appreciation. You know, a, a lot of Native Americans are very sensitive about cultural appropriation, but to me, an example of cultural appropriation would be a guy in Sedona, Arizona, a white guy, doing Indian sweat lodges and vision quests for white people. At least what I consider what I have is cultural appreciation, just the, the opposite almost of what they're saying. And I, I don't have the answers for some of this because I haven't seen it come up much other than the context of stuff that was stolen and is in huge museums in Europe and is now maybe some of it's going to get back and some of it isn't. Yeah. yeah. Molly, how do you feel about the, 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 whole, the whole sort of fraught uh, arena <laughs> of you know, questions of repatriation and appropriation? Uh, I am appalled by the history of colonialism in Africa um, and the exploitation that occurred and the appropriation of, of traditional art forms that took place in connection with colonialism. Um, I think in many ways, certainly within the last century, the The exploitation aspect has been reduced fairly significantly. And many of the pieces I think that we're seeing, in, certainly in, in our collections, are exchanges. They've been traded. Some of them created for export, not necessarily to this country, but to other areas, because the Africans have discovered, or well, know well, that that Westerners are interested in, intrigued by, um, and want to possess and be with um, African art, art that they have produced. And so that in many cases, I think what you see in this exhibit is a matter of willing exchange. Um, and so as Tony mentioned, I think it's how it's acquired often uh, is kind of the litmus test for whether or not um, it passes some kind of a moral or ethical test. Yeah, you acquired these things through purchase, you acquired them through exchange, you, yeah. and, and it was an honest exchange. So it's not as if you're not, you yeah. don't see yourselves as part of this age-old pattern of colonial powers coming in and raiding no. and stealing and looting. That's a very different trajectory. And in some ways, every work of art is different, right? I mean, it, came, it comes into your collection through a different means. Yeah. And you have to do the, eth the ethical thing at that particular moment, right? Is this, is this an honest acquisition or is this suspect in any way, right? Yeah. I think certainly many of the pieces that I have have been acquired from African traders or African gallery owners, and people who have a significant history with the works and an understanding in an anthropological and cultural way of um, the story that lies behind them. So that leads me to my final question, and that is, what does the average student learn by looking at uh, your collections of African art? What can we learn from, uh, from looking at these cultures and their beautiful artistry? Seeing something you're used to in a totally different way, like a mask. You're seeing a face that you never even thought of any kind of face like that, you know, unless you were, you know, in, into that, in, into, you know, people's faces or something. So that's kind of fascinating. And it just, a chance to learn something different about a culture. Now, it's interested, my daughter has brought two groups of her girlfriends over to see this show. And it was interesting that their comments were, we love all this stuff about women. Women breastfeeding, women doing this, women doing that, and they, that, that's the thing that, that stuck with them. So it's probably going to be different for everybody, depending on their background and what they're interested in and what a particular piece or a group of pieces opens up inside them. So I, I'm sure there's no, there's no pat answer. It's, it's gonna be different for everybody. And of course, the more you learn about something, the more interesting it is to you. 
I've had these pieces in my house forever. And even my son, who lives out in Vancouver, Washington, he goes, God, I lived with that my whole life. And now that I took the Zoom tour and read about him, it was just fast, so fascinating, I couldn't imagine, you know? And he grew up with these things since he was in like third grade, so. And plus, uh, it's been a long time for me, so you know, remembering stuff that happened over 50 years, it's been 53 years since I was in, Li arrived in Liberia with only one trip back, and it was such a different country now that it was a sort of a glimpse into the past, too. I would hope that students would learn about the richness and the depth and the variety of African culture. Um, we Westerners tend to be steeped in European culture and the forms and norms um, that have created, obviously, a great historical tradition. There's no question about it. Um, but there is a richness to African art and a dynamism to it that few of us have experienced. And I think for a student to walk into these galleries and to see these um, unfamiliar forms could be exciting, liberating, um, uh, open, them, open their eyes to new possibilities uh, that perhaps they hadn't, hadn't occurred to them before. So there's a, there's a freshness and I think a freedom to much of this art um, that's, that is liberating. Uh, and I hope that they would experience it in that, in that fashion. I think also that we Americans and Europeans as well need to be more informed about Africa as a continent and its countries. Um, and not only in the historical context, um, and you know their, their development over the many centuries that, in which we have been intertwined, if you like, but also the future of the African continent. Where is it going? Because it matters to all of us a great deal. I was reading the other day, Africa is the new frontier, and it's going to be the most populous continent, um, uh, certainly approaching Asia in terms of population in the very near future. I mean, the, the reproductive rates in many countries in Africa it now far surpasses that in the Western world. And what is it, Nigeria, I think, now has about 230 million. 230 million, and they're expected to pass, surpass the United States in population by 2050. So I think we need to be paying attention to these, um, what's going on in these countries. Uh, and um, I, th I think it's high time in many ways that we were exposed to the cultures uh, that we see displayed in this room. <clears throat> so Africa is not only our mother continent, it's, <laughs> it's, our, it's our once and future continent, right? <laughs> yes. So. And, and I think the Africans now are exploring new art forms as well that build on, that are integral to their, to their ancient traditions like El Anatsui. I read an article about him recently in which he said that um, uh, a tree doesn't have to have a blueprint in order to grow. It grows organically from the historical context and the forms and motifs uh, that are part of a cultural tradition. And I like to think that in the future, we're going to be seeing all kinds of new manifestations of ancient traditions, but in exciting and dynamic new ways. So, so an exhibition like this could um, dispel a lot of myths about Africa. One, that it's stuck in the past, that it's all traditional, that it's not contemporary in any way. Actually, the reality is that Africa is a vibrant continent that continues to be, and its art forms continue to, to evolve and change and, uh, and keep up and, and, tra and, and uh, uh, and transcend yeah. modern trends yeah. as well. So, and they're very adaptable. You know, I mean, look at those beautiful wire baskets. I mean, they're just you know developed countries. They don't have as much material to work with, so they work with what they've got. I mean, even to the new stuff coming out of Mexico, made out of the car parts. You know, all the animals and figures, and I mean, it's it's just 
it's a vibrant, changing thing all the time, and Africans really are sort of special in making use of what they got. The contemporary art scene in Lagos, Nigeria, apparently oh. is one of the most exciting, exciting in the world. I mean, speaking of dynamics, they're just, uh, you know, they're, they're building off one another and wildly creative, and it's exciting. Well, thanks to you both. Uh, thank you, first of all, for being so gracious and lending us your collections and sharing uh, what you have come to love and, uh, and sharing that with, uh, with the rest of us. It's been a really marvelous, uh, wonderful experience for, for everybody. So thank you so much. Well, it sure has been an experience for me. I, I didn't think, I mean, I, was, I liked my stuff and my family liked my stuff, but not many other people even paid any attention to it. So this has been just like a, a privilege beyond belief for me to be able to actually show these things and people to learn about them. I just, I mean, I feel blessed to have been able to do it. It was no sacrifice whatsoever. <laughs> well, I agree. It's been a great experience to, um, to work with you in, in uh, helping to put together this show. And I think above all, to know that other people will now be able to see it uh, and enjoy it, um, that, that's, that's been very rewarding. Thanks for joining us for this wonderful interview. And I want to encourage you to come visit us at the Montana Museum of Art and Culture and take advantage of these wonderful exhibitions while they're here. Uh, the exhibitions will be open through May 8th. And if you can't visit us or do a live tour, a socially distanced live tour, uh, please join us for our virtual exhibitions, our virtual tours of these wonderful shows. And those are accessible at our webpage at umt.edu forward slash Montana Museum. umt.edu forward slash Montana Museum. Thank you. <laughs>